So what should your ACO tech do for you? Um, when we, we think about this uh, question, we think about it in a capability stack. And uh, I'm borrowing one of my good friends, Katie Lance's uh, information. She presented this uh, early in 2023, but, but the value here, I think, is you think about how to approach your uh, opportunities for success still remain strong today. Um, we'll see obviously things like um, artificial intelligence and bots and other kinds of technologies start to make their way more and more into the mainstream as they get, um, you know, as they continue through their hype cycle through sort of this level of commoditization where they show up in every part of tech, we should expect to see that. Um, but pretty much for you to be able to take risk or for your ACO to be supportive of you, um, you have yourselves uh, a bit of work to do. Um, most organizations um, have started the discipline of understanding at least how to move to electronic health records. Be mindful that depending upon where you are in, in the healthcare economy itself or in the ecosystem of the healthcare economy, you could be in a place where ONC re you know, doesn't require your EMRs to be um, you know, fully certified against 2015 standards. Uh, the reality is, as soon as you start to move into risk, those requirements become, uh, you know, sort of on paper as regs with penalties and or complete, um, you know, gatekeeping, you know, keeping you from from achieving any kind of uh, participation in these ACO kinds of components. So be mindful. If you haven't solved for that initial part from an interoperability perspective, which is what the ONC measures, uh, in those in those requirements is how open is your electronic health record for being able to exchange uh, data and and make itself sort of relevant in the in today's interoperability fabric. So if we start at the bottom of this the stack, interoperability is is it was a buzzword 15 years ago. In many cases, it still is um, fairly hard to implement at scale. Interoperability, um, by definition, largely means that your interactions with your patient populations are not only visible to your staff employed by you all, but could be made visible and rendered explicit to other clinicians that might also be treating those patients. Um, in theory, it is an elegant uh, and excellent concept. In practice, it's tough. Uh, what makes it tough isn't just the technical hurdles, it's identifying patients. So I'm known as Jeremy Powell uh, as a patient but my address has changed, um, you know, as, as recently as 2014. Uh, I've also, um, you know, had, you know, many things that I hide from, like even my clinicians as it relates to my identity because identity theft is rampant. So like being able to pick me out of a data set, even if it's tied to electronic health record and making sure that's the same Jeremy Powell that I am with my demographic detail is made hard because I don't often want to share things that are common identifiers. I don't share my social security number. I'm not likely to share unless required anything about my identity because it's such an easy thing to pick up in places that aren't all that secure. Uh, and so I'm careful about it. So it's hard for even if interoperability, if, if interoperability standards are rolled out across the entirety of where I live in North Florida, it might be hard for any tool to pick out that I am this person with these kind of identity criteria. So be mindful, like these things become important to you, but you also have to, you have to tweak your own uh, perspective on which of these really matter. Interoperability matters for sure, but a ONC certified platform matters more because it allows you access to get into risk models. Even if you don't exchange data with anyone, just checking the box that say your, your capabilities allow for that become important. As you move up the stack, it really is about if your tooling is interoperable, parts of what you should be able to do from it are take data out of it. So whether that gets exchanged with the next in line clinician in that chain of care for a patient along the continuum is less important to you as an organization than recognizing, I know how interoperability is intended to work theory wise across the United States. I know how it should work, but I also know what it can provide as value. I need a certified ONC certified EHR so I can get, get through the gate and get into these programs. But more importantly, I can also use those APIs or those common programmatic interfaces to pull data out of my EMR so that I can address patient need, acuity, severity, the level of care required from an intensity of service perspective, staffing ratios, all those things. 
So those bottom three um, sitting on top of interoperability set the foundation for what really matters as we think about technology that you can um, apply today. Data and analytics is important because, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, we were really only trusting the electronic medical record, which is just your version of facts captured in your location of care, your practice, your institutional settings, et cetera. Those things were all you could run data and analytics uh, against. When the, when the, with the advent of the Accountable Care Organization or the ACO, um, Medicare started making its claims data available. So imagine in an EMR, so single focus, single practitioners, all employed under one framework, documenting care in the electronic medical record, they could then get claims data, which would tell them diagnoses, problems, conditions, uh, procedures, costs, utilization. You could see that across the entirety of a patient's journey, regardless of whether it was a specific journey related to um, care inside of, of your um, particular purview, or they had an encounter outside of what you are attempting to manage with them. So that becomes really, really impactful, um, as you can imagine, thinking about how you can know this longitudinal record without having to figure out identities, because there's one identity in Medicare, typically, and that's the Medicare bene beneficiary ID. So now can you can match your demographic data, your medical record number to a Medicare beneficiary ID, you can link those records together. I now can now start doing real um, sort of analytics, not just from my data, but from the entirety of problems, conditions, medications, um, encounter, uh, total cost, utilization patterns, et cetera. When you start to get that, as you move up this stack, you can start to communicate and unify care delivery. So we often think about um, tiers of service, like a first tier service might be administrative. You wanna support this person getting into, see your population of clinicians by you know, managing a, a, a scheduling paradigm, often in primary care as an example, 15 minute slots are what's typically given. And so you can know how far out are you scheduling your next appointments. And if you can get really good at recognizing the data and analytics that live here, you can start to unify approaches around patients that have the most severity and most clinical you know, um, crisis or interventions that might be supportive to them. And you can start literally doing those things. This becomes population health when you put them together, but it's really this concept of I'm sitting on top of all of this rich data. I can make the data useful in my model of care improvement. I can start driving not only who I monitor and engage from a case management perspective, but who I actually intervene uh, upon. And those things, again, get tagged as population management or population health. And then lastly, if you get good at the, the stack leading up to here, the, the last mile are, are your persons, the people that you have clinically, um, the intermediaries that might be in case management or and care coordination, sorry, my phone's making tons of noise. You might um, you might have the opportunity to better in, in, inform how you do transitions from not only ge geographic locations, but as patients flight from chronic to chronically complex to acute to you know end of life as examples, you can get pretty good at, at recognizing that those transitions are important and impactful for the patient journey, for the family around that patient, but they're also important and impactful for people that you, that you have as staff and your team. And you can get really good at sort of re, um, relying on persons that help those transitions occur more seamlessly. So the question at the top of the slide is, are you ready? Like how much of you all, when you think about your technology underpinnings, how much of, how much of you all focused on getting to ONC certified EHRs, um, starting to look at data that's available outside of just your, your locations of care, being able to start building interventions and models of care and monitoring case management navigation capabilities around that kind of technology. And if you've done that, then you can really play um, in any parts of the three legs of the ACO stool. So this is a, this is a concept well-worn um, if you've been on our webinars before, because we're always trying to eliminate that the the challenges that each of these legs of this stool face are differentiated. Um, the ACO or the risk bearing entity has to stay firmly focused on cost quality and utilization. 
And so we'll start with them, but I'm going to run us through just briefly again, the technology underpinnings that help all three of these entities. As a reminder, the risk-bearing entity is the ACO in this conversation. The participant is the group, usually a 10 in a set of NPIs. 10 is the tax ID number of the group. NPIs are the clinical, um, you know, provider level clinicians. Provider level is a Medicare term that says they are qualified and licensed to be able to administer medicines and can get reimbursed for those services through Medicare in this instance. So the participant is usually the 10 or the group and the provider are nurse practitioners, PA, CSNs, and physicians um, that support um, you know, care delivery. They get support often by coordinators and maybe medical assistants as examples, but we're gonna talk about all three and I'll start with the risk-bearing entity. So any questions about the stack itself before we get into the weeds or any questions about the three legs of the ACO stool? And I'll just be mindful of our Q&A session over here as well. All right, so we're gonna keep going. Um, feel free to ask questions. So let's talk about what risk-bearing entities or the ACOs think about, and especially management of, of those. So there's usually a governance and, and a board um, that has a you know responsibility of sort of defining the, the approach that the ACO is going to take. This will often include how they're gonna reimburse their participants, again, groups and practitioners. It'll, um, it'll help them understand what their model of care, like they should have a, a, an approach that says, I'm going to specifically um, chase these two or three vital things for the next year. And those things become what they measure as, are they, are they achieving the success they expected? Are they, are they meeting expectations? So the risk-bearing entity um, will think about things like risk. And risk in their world is, def is definitely different than the risk of the practice level and the risk at the provider level. And their version, risk is often tied back to HHS or CMS models, which define the risk adjustment factors. If you remember in our early webinars, often Medicare uses risk adjustment factors to predict how much a patient should cost over the course of a 12-month period starting January 1st, ending December 31st. And it's roughly a um, $10,000 patient spend per year in global uh, medical cost times a risk adjustment factor. Um, and so things that go into risk adjustment factor are the age of the patient, the location of the patient, because things like where they live will impact how much access they have, what their biases are for getting help, uh, what kind of social determinants are there. And so whatever that factor is, and there are a couple of models, HHS has one, CMS has one, it really helps define what the multiplier is against that $10,000 global spend estimate. And so these risks um, need to be well identified. And the thing that has happened historically is Jeremy Powell, the patient, you know, has issues with cholesterol, issues with hypertension, um, and takes repeat medication. So I'm a, a, you know, a man of a certain age. I, my gender and sex, my sex matters. The diagnoses matter. The number of medications I'm on, mat they matter because they ratchet up that risk score. If I was my grandmother, I would have those two things because it's hereditary. Um, and I've managed to pick some of those up from, from my family. I would also have, in her case, I would have issues related to COPD, congestive heart failure. I would have issues related to diabetes. I'd be on six or eight meds. I would have had um, a number of mini strokes or TIAs um, where blood clots have, you know, have caused real problems um, for her, uh, both functionally and cognitively. But all of that adds to the risk. Therefore, she's a far more expensive, likely cost to the ACO and to the Medicare, the payer. Therefore, that's the kind of risk they think about. And the reason they think about that risk is because they have to document care as being administered for all those things um, so that they can keep the benchmark for that patient. Uh, my grandmother in this instance, her benchmark would have been about a three, um, maybe three and a half at the very end of her life. She's passed now, but at the very end of her life, it would have been a three or three or half, three and a half. So she would have been 30 to you know $40,000 worth of typical benchmark or budget. So the risk-bearing entity thinks about how do I alert the practice about patients where codes for care delivery of, around a diagnosis um, have not been administered lately. 
but things like COPD, CHF, dementia don't resolve. They are just managed. But if you're not documenting the management of those things, Medicare thinks they got, you know, they improved and are no longer active. Even an amputation, if you don't code that you're delivering some, you know, wound care or other kinds of care to an uh, to a recent amputation, um, if a year passes, Medicare will not believe the amputation has any problems. Maybe they believe that the, the, the appendage grew back, right? Like if that's how much it's important for these risk-bearing entities to pay attention to risk. They'll also know that risk ties to cost and costs can be best um, impacted by paying attention to the types of utilization that occur. So types of utilization, um, at the baseline level, it's how much spend is occurring in places where we had an inappropriate level of care accessed? Great examples of this are hospital events where a person um, presents in an emergency setting and for things obvious or beyond our control, that emergency visit converts to an inpatient stay. Um, if that could have been avoidable because the emergent visit wasn't required, it was primary care treatable, it was you know truly an avoidable item, then we could we could have sidestepped the natural proclivity for certain patients that go to the emergency room to also convert to an inpatient setting. Um, perfect examples is 100% of the persons in the United States that are actively undergoing cancer treatment, if they present for any reason to the emergency department, they will 100% of the time get admitted. It is a hundred percent going to happen. It will always happen. It should happen. The reality is that chemotherapy and radiation therapy, as well as the cancer itself, is often quite uncomfortable for the patients. So, what is a good utilization strategy for a risk-bearing entity? And MedAdvantage does this at scale. If you get a cancer diagnosis and they see that in the claims data, they will one hundred percent of the time. Uh, invoke a referral to a palliative medicine clinician. And that person only is employed to manage symptoms because if you can manage their pain, their anxiety, their nauseousness, their uh, appetite, uh, other symptoms, if you can manage those things well, especially from the home, that person will not call 911 typically if their symptoms are well managed and they will not end up in the emergency room, which then means they will not end up in admission state. So that's a thing that they think about when they think about like, what can I do? That is an incremental set of services that I could apply in certain conditions where if those conditions are met, a trigger happens and you now have this thing that will um, improve the patterns of utilization for healthcare. Um, anyway, a uh, good example of that, often we see works very much an ACO or Med Advantage or Managed Medicare um, type approach. And this is all they think about. How do I roll out something that allows us to manage the medical cost model? The other things they think about are things that are tied together, leakage and attribution. Attribution means who is aligned to this particular contract for MSSP ACO or ACO REACH. Um, it is a prospective model in many cases, which says you've been treating these patients for this type of care under an evaluation of maintenance or EM code, which is a primary care related service. Therefore, we think you are the primary care. We're going to attribute the patient to you in this model. Leakage is where that doesn't continue, um, at least according to how Medicare reviews the claim. Somebody else becomes more of a, a care delivery um, uh, apparatus for that patient, and therefore that person who is attributed to you leaks from you to another uh, attributed provider. So really hard to manage patients over time if you don't get to keep the same ones. So these things <clears throat> tied to risk are really important because once you start teaching people what to do under certain situations where your utilization pattern and access patterns start to improve, you don't want to lose them. And so these things are examples of what risk-bearing entities really think about and their entire technology, all of it is built to think about these things, to be able to do predictive analysis around what's likely to happen if I, if I do the same thing for the entirety of my patients, who are likely to be my um, patients that get admitted patients that end up uh, having high probability of being in the ICU because of the level of need, um, patients that are long-term stay and, and skilled you know, facility kinds of probabilities, that's what they predict. And then they build models of care with you all as the participants on the next slide. They build models of care that they believe you can make actionable. So what's really cool here is you first time, uh, for the first time, you have organizations whose 
total mission is to eradicate disease and manage symptoms and to, to allow people to have the highest quality of life possible with their disease, are now participating together with organizations whose whole goal in life is to think through, if I know as much as I know actuarially, if I know as much as I know from all of this rich claims history, can I partner with groups, practices, um, can I can I partner with them in such a way that we can bring what we know, which is attribution, risk management, cost prediction, quality, et cetera, can I bring it down to things that they can know and do? So what are the practices typically, when they're doing this well, what do they know and do? do they know how to build um, actionable insights and then promote those things into um, the clinician's view so that you can really have an impact at every encounter, whether that's point of care or in, in between the encounters called case management or care coordination. So I'm gonna skip the things that, that the ACO is gonna give you. They're gonna give you evidence, often in the form of a list. Like this is your attributed patients. These are the patients you need to code for. The code means you need to document care for diagnoses, that's risk management. These are the patients, I'm moving down this uh, list here. These are the patients that are frequent faces in the emergency department. These are persons that are the highest probability of being surprise um, catastrophic expenditures. They literally know how to predict and give you an estimate of who's going to be the costliest cases for the next 12 months, who's going to step outside of what's required from a quality perspective and 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 break um our opportunity at, at getting shared savings because we have to meet certain quality thresholds. Um, how are you doing against those quality measures? Like how are you performing against, you know, gaps in care? Your diabetics aren't getting HbA1c every six months and eye and foot exam every year. You're not gonna get a quality performance bonus. Um, so they're gonna look at those things. Once you get here, this is where you pick up the reins. So if you think about the things that practices wanna tell their clinicians, um, they want to tell their clinicians, hey, your patient's not taking metformin and they've been diabetic and you've prescribed it and they were taking it, but now they're not. They're not compliant with metformin, which is what's managing their HbA1c and diabetic symptoms. That's a problem. So you as a clinician have only one way of knowing that without technology. And that's in a subjective interview when you see them in front of you. You'll say, are you still taking your metformin, your hyperlipidemia meds, your hypertension meds, et cetera? And if they're capable because they're lucid and they're not managing dementia, or if their daughter remembers, then you might get a fairly accurate read. But the data is available in the, in the, the claims. All of meds that are filled and paid for are known. So if this stops because they quit filling their med, you're going to know. And instead of being the, are you still taking um, you know, state of the art, are you still taking metformin? You can say, hey, I see that you're not filling your metformin. Can we talk about what's going on? Is it GI distress? Is it financial um, co-pays? Like, is there, you know, because we could turn on community services if it's financial and if it's GI distress, maybe we can work through other therapeutics that support this need for this diabetic management therapy. So those are the things that you get to, you know, use in your technical apparatus that literally allow for you to take the same kind of data, the claim, raw paid claims that Medicare gives the ACO. These are made available to the practices and then you can start working on things like med compliance. Disease management, <clears throat> good examples of this are COPD. Often there are really good outcomes if you manage an albuterol regimen with COPD. So the scariest thing for a patient in the history of all humankind is feeling oxygen star, feeling like they can't breathe. Um, and when that happens and somebody is starting to, you know, be less and less lucid because of their decline in their mental cog and cognitive capabilities, it's a difficult thing for the family to know whether the, the disease or the symptom of the disease is related to this person's um, anxiety that's ramping up as they're going through the dementia um, diagnosis and prognosis, or is it the COPD is exacerbated because they quit taking albuterol. So imagine again, you're going to know about things that are happening in this particular patient's life because of claims data that's not just your subjective, what's going on here, but also, um, also being able to recognize very specifically that you can react 
to um, data that's not known because of, of what's available to Medicare and CMS. So it's pulling those things into view. Um, other things you can do in your world is not only report like how you're doing against quality scores or how you're doing against cost scores to yourself over time so that you can recognize in your practice, you're going to have high, you know, high flyers that are really good at this and you're going to have low performers that need, um, you know, sort of help. The high flyers is where you learn your best practices. The lower performers is where you go and give training and, and support. So being able to report off of that data is really impactful. Um, and then being able to decide what you might build in your practice as incremental value to your patients. Predictive analytics would tell you things like who should get support because they're going to have um, potential issues. You can marry that up against, are those things tied to medical model concerns or my model of care concerns? Does my model of care include things like social work um, where I can support them? getting into safer living situations, getting better access to, to food and nutrition uh, items that might be, you know, if they're in a food desert, that might be really hard for them to get because the closest five stores are convenience stores and they're the, 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 the most compelling grocery store that has more nutritional food is, is more than a car ride away. And so some of what, um, what happens here is like, can can you bring through um, you know food surplus or food suppliers? Can you bring food to them uh, from a food bank? I mean, again, you've got to decide based on your population which of these things matter. And then you get into things that um, are the same pretty much for uh, for everybody. In the next three bullets, which are um, are you doing things to sort of manage uh, a preventive service like annual wellness visits, like every, every, every year, are you doing a 45 minute long consult with the patients to really go back, reconcile medications, understand familial support that exists, understand, you know, where they're having issues related to eyesight, hearing, um, uh, fall risks, uh, cognitive decline, et cetera. Are you doing things um, there, which are preventative in nature? And are you doing things here in the emergency notifications, which are reactive? In real time, technology vendors like us, not only can take in the claims data, but we tie into national infrastructure that allow for us to know in real time whether persons are presenting the emergency room or hospital um, and when they might discharge from the emergency room or hospital. So you would wanna react if you had a hospice case for a, this is a great real world example, a hospice case being served at home, that the son comes into town for Thanksgiving, thinks his mom looks terrible since he was last here, you know, three months ago, decides to take the reins and call 911. The hospice has, con you know, has convinced the family that the first step is to call us. This new, this new family member doesn't know that's the first step, calls 911, gets an ambulance ride to the emergency room, the hospice now knows that's happened um, because a technology has been implemented from you know folks like us, and that would let the hospice know that this this emergency visit has occurred, and it's a hospice patient. Literally, hospices will pick up the phone and say, "We have contracted beds for general inpatient services there. Let's get her into a general inpatient bed, not into a traditional med surge or ICU bed, because this has been a format that's been well patterned just by paying attention to that admission notice that happens in the emergency room." So all those things allow for you guys at the participant level to really have impactful ways of reacting, um, literally tying to this kind of data. Um, the last thing I'll talk about, and then I'll answer a few questions is, well, what happens when you're literally at the provider level and I'm a point of care clinician and what point of care clinicians always fight is I've got a list from this payer that tells me I've got to do my, you know, HbA1c and foot eye exam and eye exams. I have a list from this payer that says, here are my oncology positive patients. I've got to refer them to palliative. I've got a list from this payer that says, if I don't code these five conditions, I'm going to lose benchmark. And therefore I need to either code them or attest that these are still active so they can code them. And it's list after list after list after list. What good technologies do is they don't just provide you with list, they start driving down to insights, which are actionable, and get your teams around you to do care management. Care management is um, allowing, and in my definition, care management is allowing you to work at the top of your license. So if you're a physician or nurse practitioner or PA, a provider by definition of care, you know, care by Medicare, 
You should be working at the very top of your license, seeing the cases that require your skill set and clinical acumen. And care management can be done often by um, RNs, LPNs, CNAs, and MAs that can support um, the practice of medicine such that administrative things or patient training things or motivational interviewing or in-between encounters or scheduling events can literally be done in such a way that when you have a person in front of you that's taken up a slot on your calendar for your particular clinical knowledge, acumen, and, and treatment opportunity, then you are just bringing insights to that situation in that context that allow for you to do things. And I'll give you one quick example of that, and then we'll jump back and I'll take questions. But being able to take a patient that's now scheduled for you and recognize at a glance that you have the ability to see how much emergency room visits, how many inpatient visits, what the risk of high utilization and hospital admission is, what things you should know, which are alerts, what things you should do, which are actions you can take. Um, so alerts are things to know, actions, things to do. And then if you had coding opportunities or if you had a really low functional score that had changed or if you saw screening or other um, specialty visits, like you can make this immediately impactful to those point of care clinicians because the insights literally are um, dovetailed into their current workflow. Subjective, why are you here? Objective, height, weight, blood pressure, an exam, palpate the patient, look in the eyes and the ears, investigate the symptoms. Uh, assessment from all of that might include um, lab, lab, you know, lab uh, orders and results. It could include, um, you know, medical imagery, uh, et cetera. And then plan, it's usually either an escalation to a specialist or it's a new medication. Well, if in all of those steps, you had the ability to provide insights that were patient aligned, contextually and situationally aware, these providers would become incredibly impactful because it's not another list. It's not another needle in a very deep haystack that they have to, to go. So we think about workflow being the most important part of it. Um, and the insights have to be person and user and patient contextually aligned and situationally aligned. So those are the things that across those three legs of the stool that are really important for us to um, make sure that the, the technologies as we deliver them are uh, appropriate. Um, so I have a question, I think that's very specific to one of our um, current customers and Lynn, thank you for the question. I'll um, I'll reach back out to you because I think I need to ask that question of our client success team. I think the answer is yes, um, but I will follow up and make sure we have that based upon what data we take in from you all. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, any other questions around this broadly or, or specifically? I'm happy to answer, um, you know, going a level deeper or a level up from here. All right, we'll keep on moving. Um, one of the things that that um, people always um, sort of get a get a kick out of is like, well, what does it mean when I risk stratify my population? So it means very different things based upon the maturity of the organization, their focus on which three legs of the stool they are. Um, and what matters to their success. The things I would tell you that the most mature organizations are thinking about isn't just the CMS or, or H, uh, HHS, HCC, hierarchical condition, hierarchical condition code risks. These are the things I talked about before, age, demographics, You know, where, where do you live? What's your sex? What diagnoses do you have? What medications are you on? All those add risk. Those are, those are scaled through these two models, but there are a whole host of other models. Uh, Johns Hopkins has a huge tool. It's been around for more than 30 years. Milliman's got a tool that's competing with it. And those kinds of tools bring all kinds of other uh, perspectives on what risk and risk stratification means. I'm gonna highlight a few of these because I think they matter. Resource utilization banding is a bit like understanding, does this person flight in, you know, uh, a bell-shaped curve. Are they on the edge, uh, the you know bell-shaped curve, or then a fringe where they literally use no care? That is a good thing to know, but it may not be a good thing over time because a person whose benchmark is zero today that has a catastrophic year and goes to the very top of what your cost looks like, they are the most upside down. So knowing that they're doing nothing doesn't mean you can continue to expect them to do nothing. People on the other end 
that are literally at the other side of the bell-shaped curve that are spending to the cap. And whether the cap is a contract value like MSSP or the cap is, you know, you get to this level of spend and then stop loss takes over. So it's an insurance or reinsurance product. Um, knowing that they're at the cap and there's nothing you can do for them is also a bad thing to think because most people will have this catastrophic thing be the highest spend and then regress to the mean, which means they'll have the major cardiac event. They'll have a substantial hospital stay that'll land them in post-acute where there'll be a long-term skilled stay, then a rehab, and then finally back to home or assisted living. They're now a new normal, but their costs went like this. And then it came back down to something greater than it was before. So that's regressing to the mean. They started, you know, 10,000 to put them at the average. They have this major cardiac, uh, cardiac event uh, and all those kind of uh, care journey I just described. They get back into assisted living or to home and they don't come quite back down to where they originally were but they come really close to that. You want to try to find the persons along that journey um, and be aware of that happening. And one of the ways to do that isn't just to look at the ends of the bell-shaped curve and to know how the no, no resource utilizing group works and how the high resource utilizing group works. You want to consistently chase what's called rising risk. And so the way you chase rising risk is, is trying to look at, well, what's the probability of this person not looking at their spend before or their utilization before, but looking at the complexity, you want to rank them against the likelihood of them being in the top 5% of your cost in the next 12 months. And what that gives you a view for is it's a prediction of where this patient lands so that you can literally know who, if I have to apply my most precious resource, my clinicians, who should I apply them to first? So people that are largely healthy, largely feeling um, comfortable in the way that they're they're managing their their the, the, the symptoms, their disease state, et cetera, those persons are the average. You can you can do a, a little bit by supporting them. Those that start to feel anxiety, that start to feel pressure, that start to feel less well, and their new normal of of who they are inside of their own body is starting to feel more and more uh, impacted. They won't have the, the necessarily words in the beginning to know that that's the case, but what their data will tell us almost always is they're going to more visits with different physicians. They're starting to build a broader care team. Those care team members are starting to apply more medicines. Medicines by their nature often have side effects. Side effects often cause a low level disturbance in the body of the person. The more that you add, the more that becomes normal. That's what this ranking does. It allows for you to know that persons are transitioning from fairly healthy to a, a, attempting to be at a precipice of a big spend event. If you know that, parts of what you can do is meet them before they have the cardiac event, the hospital stay, the long-term skills stay, the rehab stay, then they're back home. And that's what tools like this, if you're doing it well, really start to look at. They start to literally look at how can you rank the patients who are probable for having an ex an ex an ex an ex a crisis event, an exacerbation of symptoms, and a really bad outcome. And if you can get in front of that, it's a pre-acute strategy. It's not a post-acute strategy. But the, the team that you use often live in post-acute. This would be palliative medicine. This might be home health. This might be um, non-skilled uh, care, which in, in most cases is, is bathing, toileting. It's the stuff that they're trying to do themselves because they're feeling so out of breath or so... Um, impacted by the change of their medications. They just don't know where else to go. And if you can support them, you can help them get things um, resolved before it becomes a major event. So these become really interesting. So I'll talk about two here, but I'm sure as you guys look at these, you probably have questions. If you do, happy to take them now um, and talk through others, but I'm also happy to open them up at the end. And after a replay, if you want to you know, get on the phone with us, we can talk through how do you go figure out what they mean and how to use them in your world? So last few slides here, I've talked about the one after this briefly, um, but I wanna set us up for it again in a little bit different way. Um, if you think about what, like, what we're in the business of, of doing, what the mission of our, of our company is, there are a number of data sources and those data sources, though interoperability is a concept those data sources don't likely flow with real fluidity and transparency and um, you know sort of objective value. They don't flow to your users in any meaningful way. 
And this includes like financial data, clinical data inside of claims, clinical data inside of the health information exchange, clinical data inside of event notifications, scheduling open, uh, openness, the ability to take in new patients, the ability to slot them in the next few days, the ability to have crisis interventions that can be slotted now. Like those kinds of things are all unknowns um, if you think about it from a holistic perspective. But more importantly, the value of these items um, really are not just aligned to the size of the circle, but how much can you do something with them? And so when we think about when we build products, when we, when we meet our customer base, we want to know like what is the highest value data source first? And then what are the highest value insights that you should be able to drive? And if that's going to be the two things you think about in the seesaw, Someone in the middle should have really, really, really elegant perspectives on how can you make this work alongside your workflow? Like literally everyone who's anywhere and other than a few paper-based practices, everyone who's anywhere doing clinical delivery of care is documenting care in a computer system called an electronic medical record or electronic health record. So it's got, this data has got to sit in either in that world, which often doesn't work because this is a whole different type of payload, a whole different type of patient identification, a whole different type of um, data. I always talk about this being railroad tracks and this being the EMR being airports. Like you don't fly um, trains and you and you and you don't have box, you know, you don't fly trains and you don't have planes landing on railroad tracks. They just don't work together. So often this intermediary has to exist technically to say, okay, how can we ingest data in such a way that we can make it actionable to every person who's already in an EMR, already learning what they know about this patient from that source of data? So that's one thing you'd want to do. The second thing you want to do is you want to get a holistic view. Holistic view doesn't mean throw everything that you can at this particular clinician at the point of care. Don't make them read 45 pages to glean the fact that there's a new diagnosis from this new specialty that you didn't know about pull that new diagnosis from all of that data and make it actionable such that, oh my gosh, I can ask during my subjective part of the interview of this patient encounter, like, hey, I see that you actually just got diagnosed with this new you know, issue related to your pulmonology uh, encounter. So, you know, tell me, tell me what that means. Are you, are you taking the meds that I see in this particular encounter? Looks like you had a new albuterol med. It looks like you're also going to be doing some respiratory therapy. So it's it's a way to ask that more pointed question versus what we typically do as the state of the art today is we don't know any of these things happening over here. So we say, tell us what's going on. You know, why are you here today? What kind of symptoms are you having? And then we rely on our clinical acumen and our experience to try to drive the rest of the encounter. We have all this data. If you could make it insightful by making it not a list or not a uh, you know, literally a needle in a haystack, huge outcomes. The other things that are happening, and this is where medicine really is starting to have um, the, the business approach applied to it. Uh, you know, it's hard to think of medicine and business in the same world because it doesn't work like most business. We don't know how much things cost. We, we wouldn't choose the cheapest eye surgeon to do my, you know, cataract surgery, like cost doesn't fit into the equation. So when we start talking about value-based care for the first time, we're starting to look at cost and quality and satisfaction together. And that's a hard leap. So we, as a business, don't try to marry the financial parts of this data to how you actually drive insights. What we look at is there's a holistic view Medicare has in an ACO about all care being applied to this patient. And that tells us again, diagnoses, problems, encounters. It tells us um, revenue codes, but not for the reasons you think from a financial perspective. It says this person was in a hospital for seven days because I can see room and board was applied for seven days. Now I know things that you can draw insights from. When you draw insights, you can recognize the way that this particular patient will have a good outcome is not just the clinical knowledge we can provide, but there are things we can do that don't change the physician's practice, doesn't change who they are, doesn't change the behavior of the patient. But if we knew if this person was about to be one of those problematic cases where crisis was going to occur and we could help sidestep that crisis by scheduling this patient more frequently, the provider is still going to do what he does. We're just now doing more for that patient who's right at the precipice of a critical um, outcome. 
And that would drive better clinical and financial outcomes. And we didn't change their knowledge of how medicine is paid for. We didn't make them become business MBAs. We just knew from our insights that this particular person is about to be critical and let's see them as frequently as we possibly can, you know, can inform the scheduler to schedule them. And that clinician is going to start seeing the, the changes that would have happened often without any visibility to clinical teams until an emergency event to happen. And then we've got this big, long thing to happen. So that is a huge driver of how we think of product. It's a huge driver of how we think of our world related to insights. And it's a huge driver of how we think of, um, of net new things that will be deployed through the Eclivity framework. Today, if you think about the state of the art across all technology, we haven't gotten there today. We're largely still trying to build at a glance documents. We're largely still trying to make the clinician the filter for what matters. And so, you know, our state of the art today is a, is a is a form like this called at a glance. It allows it to support daily huddles. It allows the point of care clinician to know what's happening. It allows us a place to give alerts and to drive action. But to be honest with you, even though we know we're going to get better, it's still really good. If you if you look here, what our tools have been able to do in their current state is in Medicare shared savings ACOs, 60% uh, average greater savings per patient and our users of Eclivity versus the rest of the world. When you move into the ACO reach models, it jumps from 60% to 2.2 times the average net savings rate. And so I'm proud of what we have, but I'm really excited about what's coming. And I would say if we, if we can do things in a future webinar that would excite you all as much as we're getting excited about, it would be telling you like, where's the where's the state of the art today versus where do we see this, this actually playing out in a year or two? And I think we don't have to talk five to 10 years anymore in healthcare because I think things that are working in the rest of you know the world as it relates to uh, advance, advances in um, technologies at the point of care are going to really explode our opportunities to make you the one in control of what alerts matter, being able to do things with those alerts that are immediately actionable. And it'll move us from this concept that we were sort of stuck in in our um, you know, six or eight years of building to what's now gonna be game changing. And I think these numbers consistently improve because it'll be dynamic and it'll literally allow for those clinicians to have their preferences manage based on how they practice. And so I'm looking forward to those, those technologies, you know, coming out of uh, our shop, but more importantly, coming across the entirety of healthcare, because I think it does drive a really, really big impact as we move in this direction.